Hello and welcome to the second part of the, the screencast on probability distributions in R. I want to make a couple of points about how R and other, often other computer programs, uh, will look at probability and think about things. And this really has to do with how we're sort of thinking about the area under the curve. Now, of course, the, the area under the curve for a probability distribution should be equal to 1. So here we're looking at for that same Poisson distributed variable that we looked at before with a lambda equal to 11. You can think about that essentially as the mean. Um, going from 0 to 20. And the area under the curve is about 0.99. Of course, it won't be exactly 1 because we'd have to go from 0 to effectively infinity to get it to be 1. But this is close enough for, for our cases. Well, this should also be true for continuously distributed variables. But let's look at two, uh, two, uh, the normal distribution for the same, uh, same mean and variance, so mean of 5 and standard deviation or variance of 1. For both of them, the only difference is the input numbers. In one case, we're going from 1 to 10 by um, intervals of 0.1. The other one, we're going from 1 to 10 from intervals of 1. Now, if we're looking at the area under the curve for both of these, they should both give us about 1. But we see in one case, we actually get an area under the curve of approximately 10. The reason why this happens is because the computer is actually, the way it's sampling these intervals looks is, is apparently different. So we can actually get different numbers. So if you actually want to get sort of the absolute um, heights, they're not really the probabilities, but the absolute heights of these distributions, you need to divide out by that sum. So in the upper case by 10, in the lower case by 1, essentially. And I think it's worth pointing this out sort of again in a slightly different way. Here we're just going to plot um, 100,000 random numbers from that same distribution. And uh, here the, we can see both in the blue dots or the, the sort of the basic histogram, that's the random numbers. The red is, or the pink, whatever color it is, is the uh, theoretical curve, theoretical distribution. However, let's take a look at it. So we're plotting that same distribution just two different ways with, and again, coming back to by intervals of 1, so from 0 to 10 by 1 or 0 to 10 by 0.1. Let's plot those one at a time. So here's what it looks like here. So here it's 0.4, it's that height at the top, top and you can see sort of 0.3 or 0.25 over here. Let's do that same thing, but now for these smaller intervals, so we get a lot more points. Well up here it's still 0.4, right? The height is not changing. So what's going on? Again, we can just take a, a look at these and we'll get those differences in the areas under the curves, those sums. So we go from 1 to 10. And that's because Basically what it's doing is it's sampling along all those points, but the interval size uh, to do its computation uh, is the same. So as it samples along, you're just getting more points, and so that's going to basically increase it. So it's going to be a function number of points you call. And that's why you would need to scale by this area under the curve if you wanted something that was at least approximating the, the true value of the height. Okay, a couple of other little quick things. Um, Let's just take, I have to get rid of our old x. We're going to generate uh, 10,000 new observations using R norm from the same distribution with a mean of 5, standard deviation of 1. And let's take a, um, we're going to do a histogram, but instead of plotting it, we're going to call hist for x, and we're just going to say plot equals false. And what we can do is say what are the counts. And it's going to say in each of the intervals, hist is actually figuring out the breaks for us and how many observations fall within each of those intervals which we see. So of the 10,000 we did, uh, we have you know, approximately 1,900 falling in sort of a central interval, probably very close to 5, uh, 1,800 on one side, 1,483, and, and we go down. So if we essentially look at those counts and divide it by the total number of counts that we have, which should be just 10,000, we'd actually get something approximating the height that we would expect to see. And so histogram can either produce it scaled or unscaled. So let's plot all of these. And so on the top are just the raw counts. Um, and here is scaled so that it's the area under the curve. And here it looks like I've plotted it slightly differently, but that's just going to be the proportion. So these are giving approximately the same thing. I should have scaled them a little bit better so that they would be a little bit more equivalent in terms of breaks, but they give the same idea. But by default, it will often do it in terms of the raw observed values. And so you have to think about what you want to plot. Uh, and generally, you're interested in this freak equals false rather than the absolute counts. 
So it'll plot it essentially, it even changes the name here to density as opposed to frequency. Okay, so I won't go through this, but I just want to let you know that here's a list of all the different distributions that you p potentially could use in R. I'm sure there's more than I have listed here, but here are all the standard ones. Uh, and I've also got a bunch listed in when they're in special uh, libraries. So, for instance, the multivariate normal distribution is available in the mass library. The derelict uh, is available in GTools. The Wishart and inverse Wishart are available in MCMC Pact, and then so on. Um, and we don't need to worry about the conjugacy right now, but I just put this down here because you'll probably use this mostly when you're using, um, starting to do some basic Bayesian inference. You might want to remember what some of your conjugate inferences are. So that ends this basic screencast on, on, on some basics of doing probability in R, um, and we'll move along soon.